At your age with no position of responsibility, someone as incompetent as you is not needed in our company. I have prepared a termination letter and we will pay severance. Pack your things and leave immediately. I silently endured the president's abusive tirade. Arguing with such a person is futile. Understood? I'm terminated, I calmly stated. I quickly packed my belongings and left the office. To an outsider, I might appear as a defeated loser at the mercy of the president, but I had already grasped her vulnerability. I am Caroline, 48 years old. Most women my age are married with grown children or even becoming grandmothers, but I am still single. I have had my share of romantic relationships, but simply never ended up married. Not that I completely lacked the desire, but with a fulfilling job and wonderful colleagues, I was content. However, a drastic change occurred a few months ago. My company is family-run, with executive roles filled exclusively by the chairman's relatives. The chairman's son, daughter, and their spouses all held sway. This didn't mean that we, the non-relatives, were treated poorly. Indeed, it was possible for us to climb the ranks. The chairman's charismatic leadership kept the company well-knit, and we had no major complaints. In fact, the bond among colleagues was strong, and we worked together daily with united effort. But when the chairman suddenly passed away and his son took over as chairman, the company faced an unexpected turn. The new president was Helena, the chairman's daughter. She was previously unknown to the company, and many of us were shocked that such an outsider was appointed. However, we learned that she had been quite successful in her previous job at a top-tier company and joined ours at an opportune time, which made us somewhat understand the decision. At 38, Helena was also single, and my colleagues speculated about her character. Perhaps a dedicated career woman or a tough, cold person. However, her appearance at the inauguration was the complete opposite of our expectations. She looked more like a club hostess with high exposure, teetering on thin high heels and dangling large earrings. The strong perfume was noticeable even from a distance, causing many a grimace. Her speech, impacted by her appearance, felt shallow and lacked a sense of commitment and passion for the company, leaving me with a sense of unease. But worrying wouldn't help. Focusing on the work at hand, I tried to shake off the inauguration's aftermath and settled into my tasks. However, not long after, Helena, our president, unexpectedly visited our department. Tension briefly spiked, but she ignored everyone and made a beeline for a colleague, Cecil, announcing... I like you. You stood out at the ceremony earlier. Cecil, such a cute name. How about joining me for lunch to celebrate my appointment? Cecil turned pale and froze. Not just him. Everyone there lost their words and stood like statues. What was the president even saying? That was the atmosphere. Oh, don't look so surprised. Shocked to be invited by the president? I find that quite endearing, Helena continued before grabbing Cecil's arm, intending to leave. Cecil interjected, Please wait. I appreciate the offer, but I have urgent work to finish this morning. Could we possibly wait until break time? It was barely past 10 a.m., too early to abandon work for a lunch outing. Is your work really that urgent? If so, someone else can handle it. Lunch with the president is far more valuable to you. I'll teach you what to prioritize, she insisted pushing Cecil along despite his reluctance. By the time they returned, it was past 2 us p.m. Cecil, 38, divorced a few years back and now single, was admired for his refined looks, growing more handsome with age. Many female colleagues harbored secret crushes on him, rejoicing at his divorce as it meant he was back on the market. While Helena's fondness for Cecil might be understandable, her behavior was unbecoming of a president. It was a revealing day, highlighting Helena's true character. To make up for the morning's disruption, Cecil ended up working late, a consequence of Helena's actions that benefited no one. I reserved a wonderful French restaurant for us today, the one with the chef I mentioned before. We better hurry or we'll be late. Helena would often appear, forcibly taking Cecil out for lengthy lunches. Cecil, you look so dignified while working. What are you working on now? As this became a regular occurrence, she began occupying the seat beside Cecil, disrupting his work with her chatter. 
Colleagues displaced by Helena struggled to complete their tasks, often resorting to overtime. Gradually, a simmering discontent towards Helena grew among the staff. While no one dared to voice their frustrations openly, it was clear that everyone shared the same sentiment. When exactly does Helena perform her presidential duties? Presidential d- it seems like she's not taking her job seriously at all. That's the look my colleagues and I shared as we watched her. I was busy helping Cecil and others with their work and overtime. While assisting Cecil one day, I tried to lighten the mood. Cecil, you've really been put through the ringer. It's tough being targeted by the wrong person, he responded apologetically. I'm so sorry for causing everyone trouble. I really appreciate your help, Caroline, especially since you have your work too. Cecil, it's not something you need to apologize for, I said. It's all because of that out-of-touch president. Honestly, what was the chairman thinking, making Helen a president? But keep that between us, I joked, sticking out my tongue, and Cecil gave a weak smile. It had been a while since I'd seen him smile. In fact, I realized that smiles had been rare in our department lately. How long would these days continue? The mere thought weighed heavily on my mind. Determined to break this cycle, I decided to consult someone about it. Carl, the chairman, and Helena's father. When I joined the company, Carl was the executive vice president, and we occasionally chatted. Now, as chairman, our interactions had ceased, but I boldly went to see Carl and frankly discussed Helena's problematic behavior. Knowing it might be impertinent, he was a dignified man, a son of the previous chairman. I hoped he would understand the employee's struggles, but Carl's response was dismissive. I'm not here to listen to such complaints. You are to follow President Helena, work for the company, and earn your salary. That's all. It's simple. And with that, he sent me away. I realized then that Carl, who had appointed Helena as president, was just another fool. Disappointed and furious, I felt a surge of anger. The next day, Helena came again to invite Cecil to lunch, but our department was bustling with a crucial project deadline. Amidst the tense atmosphere, Helena's presence only fueled irritation and some of my colleagues couldn't hide their annoyance. I'm sorry, I really can't leave my work today. Could you perhaps dine alone? Cecil tried to decline politely. Helena insisted, It's fine. Someone else will cover for you. Hey, you there. Take over Cecil's work. Unbelievably, Helena approached me and said, Right now, both Cecil and I are swamped with work. No one in the department has the capacity to take on additional work. I'm sorry, but that's not possible, I firmly replied. Helena widened her eyes in disbelief. What did you just say? I heard you say you can't. Despite momentarily faltering under Helena's stern gaze, I knew I had to speak up. I said it's not possible. Cecil's tasks today are critical, and I also have a pile of my own work to complete. Taking on Cecil's responsibilities is simply out of the question. Every time you pull Cecil away, our department's progress stalls affecting the company's performance significantly. As president, you must be aware of this. We're even getting complaints about poor responsiveness from clients, and we're losing credibility. If this continues, we'll be overtaken by our competitors. I had let out my frustrations, but there was no turning back now. Do you even know who you're talking to? You know what happens when you speak against the president, right? Helena's voice, so different from the sweet tone she used with Cecil, was filled with intimidation as she retorted, I'm speaking out of concern for the company. We're all striving to improve performance. I can't comply with actions that will hinder our success. We need Cecil at his desk right now. There was so much more I wanted to say, but I carefully chose my words, remembering she was still the president. Is that all you have to say? I'm shocked to find such a lowly employee among us. Helena sneered, snatching my employee badge to read my name. Caroline, huh? It figures you'd say such vulgar things. You're going to regret what you did today. Then, turning sweetly to Cecil, she said, Cecil, let's try again tomorrow. I'll book an Italian place. My mood's been spoiled by this silly little scene. With a fluttering wave, she left the department. As Helena disappeared, applause erupted around me. Colleagues praised me, saying how refreshing it was and how cool I'd been, but I didn't feel relieved. Helena's words weighed on me. I knew this wouldn't end without repercussions. Caroline, are you okay? Cecil placed a comforting hand on my shoulder, looking at me with concern. Are you okay, Caroline? 
I know you spoke for all of us, but now you're in the president's sights. I'm on your side, though. If anything happens, I'll be here to protect you. His strong reassurance lightened my heart slightly. I was grateful for such a supportive colleague, though Helena's retaliation might start as soon as tomorrow. With these colleagues by my side, I felt ready to face it. However, Helena's actions were more straightforward than I expected. She showed up in our department the very next day to announce, You at your age, with no significant position, not proficient at work, just getting older and more on site. How dare you talk back to me? Someone who has remained a mere employee all these years is not needed in this company. Frankly, you're an eyesore. You're fired as of today. Pack your things and leave. I was astounded by the abrupt and harsh dismissal. Fired? I echoed in disbelief. Helena, with rough breath, pulled out a piece of paper. Yes, but it's not wrongful termination. Don't bother suing. Here's your termination letter and we'll even pay severance. Now hurry up and leave. As Helena ranted, that's too much. President Caroline, our moral support indispensable to this company. Cecil stepped up, fists clenched. Helena scoffed. Cecil, you're mistaken if you think it's good to side with such an incompetent woman. It seems you've been influenced by her because you've worked together for too long. How pitiful. She's a detriment to this company. It's only right she's fired. I stood silently, absorbing Helena's verbal abuse. Arguing with someone like her was futile. If you say my presence is detrimental to the company, then I must accept my dismissal. I replied calmly, quickly packing my belongings and leaving. Though I couldn't suppress my intense anger, I was determined not to let this end here. I had already identified Helena's weakness. The next day, I welcomed a refreshing morning, had breakfast, and cleaned my house. It should be about time, I thought, glancing at the clock. As it struck 10 a.m., right on cue, my phone rang. The company's number flashed on the screen. The caller was easy to guess. It must be Helena. Slowly, I answered. Caroline. Oh, thank goodness you picked up. Listen, about the firing yesterday, it was just a joke. I never imagined you'd take it seriously and actually not show up today. I'll overlook your tardiness, so please come to the office as usual. Helena spoke in the same controlling tone she used with Cecil. You're so honest, Caroline, to take such a joke seriously. Helena's voice quivered slightly. It wasn't a joke. I have the signed termination letter. Does the company sign such things as a joke? If so, that's a terribly irresponsible company. A president who flirts with male employees and publicly humiliates an employee is disgraceful. I want nothing more to do with such a company. Helena was speechless at my words, so I pressed further. I know everything that happened this morning in the office and that you'd come crying to me for help. I had heard all about it from Cecil. Today was an especially important day for presenting our company's best product to a crucial client. Success would significantly boost our company, while failure would allow competitors to leapfrog us to industry leadership. It was such an important presentation, even Helena must have recognized this importance as she attended the morning meeting. To motivate everyone, she asked who was in charge of the presentation, but no one came forward, and the room fell silent. Of course, I was the presenter. When Helena realized this, she panicked, but then asked if anyone else could handle the responsibility. But what Helena found in front of her were resignation letters from all employees. Seeing my dismissal, everyone had had enough of the company. Hearing this from Cecil, I informed Helena, Please, if you're there, Caroline, the presentation can still go ahead. We don't have much time before the meeting with the client. I'll double your salary, and you'll be treated as a director. Please come back, please. Helena pleaded hysterically, almost incomprehensible. Unfortunately, I have no intention of returning. Please handle it yourself. As president, you haven't worked properly and have been chasing employees around, decreasing performance. I don't think you have the capacity to manage it, I said before hanging up. I dismissed her further calls without hesitation. It would be interesting to see how she managed alone. That evening, Helena and Carl came to my house. As I cautiously opened the door, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, please forgive us, they pleaded tearfully. Apparently, the presentation had been a disaster from the moment Helena arrived alone. The client must have been skeptical. Just minutes into the presentation, they stormed out, 
disgusted with Helena's incompetence. They said they'd reconsider if you were involved. Caroline, please, for the company's sake, come back, Helena pleaded. My anger erupted. For the company? How can you say that? You've disrupted employees' work, fired me for speaking up, and caused everyone to turn against you due to your arrogance. This is the result of your actions. Please leave. As I attempted to close the door, Helena sprang up. It's all because you interfered with my lunches with Cecil, embarrassing me in front of everyone. That's why I fired you. You got in the way of my lunches with Cecil. That's all it was. What a childish notion. I knew it, but hearing it directly from her made me feel sick. I'm begging you to come back. Suddenly, Helena lunged at me but was swiftly stopped by Cecil, who had come out of concern. Enough, please. I came because I was worried about Caroline. I can't believe it's come to this, Cecil said, surprising both Helena and me. Helena, let me make it clear. Dining or talking with you has been nothing but a pain. Because I have someone I like. I've told you many times, but you only looked at my appearance and never listened, Cecil confessed, leaving Helena paralyzed. Caroline and the other employees who resigned have already found new jobs. A competing company looking to expand was thrilled to hire us all. Everyone is talented, and they were delighted. Caroline and I are not coming back. You're the reason she was unfairly thrown out of the company. Please don't show up in front of us again, Cecil said firmly. Helena tried to say something but was pulled away by Carl, who was also pale. He was the fool who appointed Helena president and dismissed my desperate pleas. There's no room for sympathy without it supporting employees and missing a great opportunity. The company's reputation plummeted, leading to bankruptcy. I am sorry to the wonderful predecessor, but once the predecessor was gone, it was only a matter of time before it came to this. Helena and Carl disappeared, buried under immense debt, living lives I don't even want to imagine. Meanwhile, Cecil and I began dating. The confession that I was the person he cared for came as a sweet surprise. After years of working together, our relationship evolved from trusted colleagues to partners. I'm grateful I didn't rush into marriage when I was younger, as I've now found the best partner later in life. Life is unpredictable. Maybe Cecil and I will get married. That's what I've been contemplating recently.